good afternoon once more. Uh, how's everybody doing out there in webcast land? Yeah, we're back <laughs> live now, and uh, we're glad to have the final segment of today, the Customer Service Week Reaching for Excellence special event. So happy to have you aboard. I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping up here ahead of time, just so everybody knows what's going on this afternoon. Uh, if you have need of help, assistance, if you have a technical issue, there is a help tab up in the top white menu bar that will bring up the interface with the help folks behind the scenes here at an expo, and they will be happy to help you out. If you have a question for the presenters today, please make sure that you type it in the bottom ask a question bar and click submit and we'll take questions as time permits after the live presentation. And also don't forget that we have a couple of great prizes to give away today. First we have a copy of Micah Solomon's High Tech, High Touch Customer Service. That's a great book and we're going to be giving that away. A random attendee will be selected. And also we're going to be giving away a very nice prize which is a free registration to the HDI 2015 Conference and Expo at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. And as you can see, nice. well, a little bit short of $1,600 uh, value, so that's just terrific. And uh, we invite you to use some of the tools that we have to re remain connected to each other. Uh, remember that you can not only take part in the group chat and lounge, you can also connect with us on HDI Connect. There's blogs, there's chats, there's uh, you know question and answer type entries there, message boards and also a buyer's guide, so take advantage of that. And also we have two main LinkedIn groups, the HDI Professional Association for Technical Support Professionals and the HDI Desktop Support Professional Discussion Forum. Uh, the Professional Association group has about 8,000 and the Desktop Support has about 3,000 people in it, so that's all good. Join up and join the discussion. And again, I would like to thank today's sponsors, SolarWinds, BMC Software and CA Technologies for sponsoring the three segments that we have. It is just a thrill to have them uh, partake of the joy which is uh, the HDI monthly webcast and this is a very special edition today. So coming up <clears throat> next we have Eric Hilla and uh, Eric is representing CA Technologies and uh, I'll just give you a little bit of information about Eric. He is the Senior Principal Marketing Manager at CA Technologies, and he's led all aspects of product marketing for a number of solutions within the CA Technology Service Management Suite. He was directly responsible for the design and execution of product marketing activities for CA Cloud Service Management, formerly CA NIMSOFT Service Desk, and CA's SaaS-based service management solution. So we're very glad to have you here today representing CA Technologies and Eric Take it away. Thank you so much, Roy. And folks, thank you all so much for attending. I know that when we uh, we'll get into sort of the sponsored sessions, that, that oftentimes I think the concern is that you're going to hear an awful lot of bitchiness. And I'm hoping that for the next couple of minutes I can do just a, a little something different with the time. You know, we, we've had a lot of discussion today um, about the customer experience. We're going to have a great uh, discussion here coming up from Micah about a high touch customer experience from his perspective as well. And one of the things that seemed, uh, you know, pretty apropos for the day was just, you know, how do you get started very quickly in this space? You know, we've had a lot of folks that have been, you know, involved with solutions in the IPFM market for long periods of time. Sometimes they're stuck, sometimes they're not. Um, and, you know, when people are now looking at what they're, they're trying to do in, in this space of their business, I want to just try and give a little bit of guidance there. Um, and, and just to sort of start off, you know, what I thought I'd do is kind of bring to your attention, um, you know, some, you know, some things that I consider sort of key facts. You know, in, in essence, you know, we've spent an awful lot of our budget currently just on kind of maintaining, um, you know, where we're at from an operational standpoint. And, you know, we've got ticket volumes that are going up. Um, we've got 56% of fo folks that expect that their IT budget is going to decrease or even stay the same. 
And yet at the same time, um, you know, oftentimes we find that we're having difficulty meeting expectations. So, you know, in, a, in some work that we actually did with HDI last year, what we found is only 29% of you guys will say that, you know, your, your strategic priorities are perfectly aligned with what the business is looking for. And just as importantly, 86% of you will, uh, of our support organizations will say that we really feel pressure to show value to the business in, in order to really give more to the business than, than we're giving today. So hopefully that resonates with you and then you kind of go, aha, yeah, that feels right to me. Because, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, what we're finding is that this concept of showing business value is one of the top concerns. So, you know, it's, it's not just HDI. You know, in, in a Gartner survey of, um, uh, of, of European customers, of their European uh, you know, folks that they do business with, 68% of European organizations identified from business value as their top, one of their top three concerns as well. So when you take that and you sort of take a step back, you know, what we really see, I think, is that the application economy, the focus of of people to kind of deal with applications, to deal with your company in a myriad of different ways, what's really changed the, the end user. You know, what they're, they're experiencing is more diverse ways to actually get at information, both in their personal and increasingly in their business life. They're demanding things that are easy to use, and of course, really we want to get it up and, and get it going fast. And not only, I think, fast in terms of getting started with applications, which, of course, touches on that whole easy to use principle, but we expect things to happen more quickly. We're a lot less tolerant of big delays, you know, faster responses to uh, incidents that are open, uh, faster resolutions to uh, the big problems that we might have. All of this is really driving in, uh, impatience from the end user's perspective, and it really means that the application economy it's fundamentally changing what we need to do from a service management perspective. Now, of course, what that becomes challenging is right now a lot of times we're really not all that flexible. And, you know, if we actually go to implement a solution, it takes us months, if not, you know, a year to get started often. Um, we might find that uh, just the adoption is taking weeks to get started. And that, um, you know, configuration, getting the thing set up and customized for our environment, it involves a lot of different people. It might involve programmers and people that have to customize the tools to do just the right thing. And there's just an army of people. At the same time, when we go to administer that, we've got, you know, we've got people that are doing database. We've got people that are, are managing, um, you know, the network. We've got all kinds of people involved in that process as well. And upgrading then, because we're starting typically with an on-premise solution, well, that means we have to kind of do everything kind of on its own as well. We have to upgrade the tenant or, you know, the, the, the database. The, 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 we have to upgrade all of the customizations. We have to duplicate our reporting, all of which we need to kind of pull in. And then, of course, we want to extend the capabilities because we've typically taken a modular approach. But we have to kind of choose which ones we want to pay for and which ones we want to implement. And, of course, the more money you spend, the better off you're going to be. So if you really think about that abstractly, at the end of the day, what we're looking at is a solution that's pretty, you know, takes a long time to get started with, requires a lot of specialized resources, and has a really high total cost of ownership. Now, in the context, of you know, all the communications we have, what we also mean, so is that we get sort of stuck on some things. We get stuck on like old telephone communications. We get stuck um, not giving people the, the, the channels that they're looking for. So in addition, because of this inflexibility, what we're finding is you know, we're slower to respond, and we're caught in more expensive channel, uh, channels, which is going to end up hurting the user experience, too. So. What we then find is, you know, a lot of people are starting to look at, at maybe more SaaS-based approaches, right? So, in fact, you know, because we look at, you know, the need to update all of those things and only 37% 30, uh, of those projects that are associated with the database and associated with the reporting and associated with the customization, so a lot of 30% of them will fail. And, you know, so what people are looking for typically is how can we get started quickly? How can we use less resources and how can we have a lower total cost of ownership? In other words, how can we give value, time and productivity, at a reasonable cost? But even here, what we're still finding is that oftentimes when people have made that move to SaaS, made that move to cloud-based communications or cloud-based solutions, oftentimes they've taken a, a, a tough first step. So, you know, 
know, going back to Gartner, 52% of global organizations took about the same time or more time for their initial rollout of SaaS than they did, than they did relative to their on-premise install. And you know, 57% of organizations didn't reduce staff quite the way they thought they would. And at the end of the day, what's really happening is, you know, we're still facing the same challenges. We're still inflexible. Because a lot of SaaS solutions are customized and complex. They're slow to implement and they're difficult to upgrade. They're basically taking all the problems we had from that on-premise world and they're rolling that forward into a cloud-based world. So the system ends up being inflexible, IT-centric, and pretty expensive. So this is in essence, where cloud service management and where our SaaS-based approach at TA is different. What we're trying to do is deliver on the promise of SaaS so that it's easy to use, flexible and configurable. Those, auto, those upgrades are automatic with a faster time to value, a lower total cost of ownership, and fewer resources required. So going back to our concept earlier, you know, instead of taking months to implement, it's going to take weeks. Instead of you know, taking weeks to get adopted, it's really just days, instead of, um, you know, needing a whole bunch of, of people to, uh, to to manage the system and customize the system. Well, business users are going to do that in, in our realm. And administration, instead of an army, we're talking about kind of, you know, two FDEs according to, to information we've pulled from Tech Validate. Because it's a multi-tenant approach, we have automatic upgrades, and, of course, it's an inclusive um, inclusive approach with everything kind of under one house, if you will. So rather than modular and complex, we're, we're giving you everything you need out of the box. The end result, lower time to value, fewer specialized resources, and a low, lower total cost of ownership. And just to kind of give you some, some specifics against that, you know, right now we currently have rapid implementations that can take as little as a week. Our configure don't code approach means that you don't have to use any Java programmers. Um, according to Tech Validate, we have it takes us typically less than two FDE to, to maintain and, and this solution and automatic upgrades mean that there's no cost associated with that. Down here at the bottom you'll actually see a, a quote from one of our customers and says with the fast based model, GA lowered financial and operational barriers to adoption that we have historically had in implementing service desk solutions. The, the excellent service from CA has helped us overcome issues with the implementation partners, and we're looking forward to greater visibility to IT issues. So to summarize, in essence, you know, we're rewriting the, the, the rules of service management by being fast, flexible, powerful, and personal. If you'd like to give this a try, please come to our website. You can try it free for, for 30 days. Um, and uh, the, the login is ca.com backslash cloud ITSM. And so with that, um, I'd just like to say thanks and maybe leave a, a quick space, Roy, for, for any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Eric, for that informative presentation. And uh, I don't think our attendees have, any, have submitted any questions through the interface. Uh, if you have a few minutes, you might want to jump over into the group chat and, and talk with the folks over there. I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, discuss this with you. And uh, thanks again. And thank you, folks. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Talk to you soon. Bye. So next up today, we have Micah Solomon. And uh, Micah, as I, as I mentioned, and as I believe he will mention during his presentation, is giving away a copy of his high-tech, high-touch customer service book today, very kindly. That's great. He is a business speaker, consultant, and best-selling business author, known for his ability to transform business results and build true customer engagement and loyalty. Micah offers entirely customized speeches, programming, and consulting for a range of industries, hospitality, banking, automotive, food services, financial services, legal, health care. So he knows a, a lot of different vertical spaces, and I know that a lot of those are represented here today, the attendees. He specializes in bringing company cultures and results in line with 21st century realities in a way that feeds the bottom line and was named the new guru of customer service excellence in the financial by the Financial Post. So we're very, very pleased to have uh, you here today, Micah, and take it away. Wow, thank you so much. So uh, I always knew Roy over Twitter, but when I heard his voice, I thought, 
wow, he's a professional. And in fact, he has done some uh, professional voiceovers. So if you recognize his voice, um, maybe you heard him uh, in some version of Siri or something. So hi. That was quite an introduction to live up to. The most important thing to know is that uh, one of you shall be selected to get a free copy of my book. And um, if you don't win, it doesn't mean you're a loser. It just means go to my site if you'd like, and there is a free chapter of my book. So if you can spell my name, which I know is hard, micasolomon.com, you can get a free chapter of the book. And I did pick one of the better chapters rather than some, uh, some filler, not that there is any filler in there. So I hope you win. And if you don't win, I hope you get a free chapter anyway. So what I want to talk about today is, first off, the world has changed. And I've tried to figure out the best way to talk about that. And I think we can go back to what we all learned and forgot really quickly, the four Ps, product, place, price. Pr it was always hard to remember all of them, but product, place, price and promotion. What this really meant, in other words, was you could hire some amazing marketer, some Don Draper or Peggy Olson, to add this spin, this patina of magic to whatever you were selling. So Don Draper, and this is an actual case. This isn't from the show, though uh, it was paralleled very closely on the show. Um, you, you could hire someone like Don Draper. He would hire someone to track down 20,000 doctors. The doctors would somehow be convinced to sign something saying, toasted tobacco is good for your throat. And a, and a completely shameless auditor like Librand would uh, get these results um, audited. Not that it was true, but that these doctors had said it and your work would be done. Whatever you were selling, whether it was good for you, bad for you, indifferent, fabulous, it didn't matter so much because marketing had that kind of power. Now, one day, or maybe more realistic to say over time, the world woke up. Our customers woke up. And how I would describe their awakening they stopped believing what a, what a company says about itself unless what the company is saying matches what they've experienced or what their friends or what their acquaintances online are saying about you. So this is a really different model. Instead of the four Ps, which were so some of it had to do with logistics, but some of it had to do with adding something to your product, something called marketing. What we have now is three H's. These don't erase the importance, but they decide very much whether your marketing is going to work. These three H's I designed to have be easier for you to remember, though we'll see if I made it easier or harder. Each one of the H's is simply a kind of human. So these are the three factors that decide whether your message is going to be, whether customers will be receptive to your message or whether they're going to ignore it. So the first kind of H are friends and family humans. These are the people your customers know in their real life. The second kind are company-sponsored humans. These are the people that customers interact with at your company. Now, to be fair, the success of that interaction is in significant part based on how well those humans are supported behind the scenes. So the um, systems used by those company-sponsored humans are also important. The third group, and certainly the newest, uh, most visible change, are the uh, important online community humans, the people customers know online or whom they feel they can trust online. 
Now, the 3-H world is treacherous. Sometimes I label those two dogs. Uh, the big one is Amazon and the little one as your business. And that works in a, in a shockingly large number of industries. Uh, don't worry, these are my dogs. Nobody was harmed in the course of making these slides. Um, but regardless, the big world out there is the big dog, and you are potentially caught in the teeth. However, the nice thing is, that the 3-H world also offers you unprecedented power. Why do I say that? Well, remember how these things used to work? You would mail to a list. Remember that you would rent a list? You would mail to the list. A few people would respond. Then you would resend to that same list. Next time it wouldn't work even quite as poorly as it worked the first time. It would work even worse. Third time, it worked so poorly that you had to uh, break down and buy another list. By contrast, when you get people talking, especially digitally talking, your marketing, so to speak, can expand and expand. But you do need to know where to start. The place to start is not with, you know, I do a lot of consulting, and sometimes the assignment, the intended assignment sounds something like this. Micah, we want you to bring us a lot of best practices. So that's great, but that's not where it starts. Where it starts is with a decision. And let's back into this decision. This is a photo, an actual photo that I took at a four-star hotel in a major American city. And I walked into my suite, which I had paid almost, but you know, I know exactly how much I paid. Sadly, I remember this bitterly. I'd paid $289. I walk in, and on your right, you can see the traditional marketing. Uh, it says legendary service and so forth. But what my eye went to immediately was this accusation that I want to steal their stupid $2 corkscrew. Can you see how they have it uh, literally locked down on a bicycle-style security chain? So they were accusing me of wanting to steal this. And so I could tell that they hadn't made the decision. What is the decision? The decision is, are you going to put your customers at the center of your company, the center of your department? even at the center of how you design the web forms. This one is going to be quite hard to see on your screen. Sorry about that. But um, this is a company with more than 97% of its customers in the US, more than 97%. And yet what's on there are just from the S's to the U's, because I was trying to enter United States. So uh, I got to go through all these funny places, uh, Tuvalu, Turkmenistan, Togo, Uganda, all these places um, just to get to the United States. And the 3% who aren't in the United States could have been identified as, as uh, the exception via uh, their IP address. So they're not putting the customer at the center of their department. Now, you might think this is silly, but I gave a speech to a group of utility companies not too long ago. And people are laughing <laughs> at this example. So I called someone out. He was a nice guy. He didn't mind. And I said, where are you from? And he told me the state he was from. So literally 100% of his customers are from his state, right? 100%. So I said, well, does it pre-fill with uh, the postal abbreviation for your state? He said, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. So this stuff is very easy to overlook. So once you make the decision, you'll start seeing these things everywhere. USAA Insurance is a company that's made this decision. It, it, I would argue they call their customers members. And in fact, if they over, um, overestimate their insurance uh, losses, uh, you, you, you members actually get a refund at the end of the year. So they lose almost no customers. And they do it without having to pay for a spokes gecko. 
they don't have to pay for a spokes gecko. What they pay for instead, what they invest instead in, is deeply understanding their customer base, their specific customer base. So their customers are uh, all related to the military. Sometimes it can be a very tenuous relationship, like I'm a USAA member because my dad was in the public health service. So it can be a very tenuous relationship, but sometimes that's not. Sometimes it is servicemen and women on the front line so, or deployed overseas. So if that's the case, those are going to be some of your most stressed customers, as well as their uh, family members back home are also going to be under a, a lot of stress. So at orientation, you can see these ladies in the San Antonio headquarters. And what they're doing, you can probably tell, is they are preparing and eating MREs, meals ready to eat. So during this orientation, they're understanding, even though we have the opportunities to uh, go to Panera, et cetera, for lunch, the reality faced by the person on the phone is different. And we need to understand their level of um, their level of stress to help us do our job in a more customer-centered way. So I would like to talk about um, basic customer satisfaction. So basic customer satisfaction is kind of not very, very sexy. So you'll never find a customer who says, woo-hoo, what, what's the name of the gentleman? Uh, John Yance, the uh, duct tape marketing guy, so he and I were talking about it. What we decided is there's no customer in the world who is going to say, woohoo, I really had a satisfactory experience with that company. Because it's not that exciting, but it's very important to be able to create satisfactory service over and over again. Here are the four elements that are required for a satisfactory customer experience. First, you need a perfect product. Now, those are scary words. First of all, by product, I mean product or service or anything, any combination. Okay. As far as perfect, though, all I mean is designed and tested to perform perfectly within reasonably foreseeable circumstances. So we, we've all been warned about this word perfect. If you're from a religious family, you might have heard nobody's perfect except for God. If you're from a secular family, we used to hear nobody's perfect except for Toyota. But now we know that none of us, at least none of, none of we humans, are perfect. What I mean by perfect is only that it's designed and tested to work in reasonably foreseeable circumstances. Then you need caring delivery. A perfect product delivered in an uncaring manner is imperfect. Timeliness is very, very important. A perfect product delivered in a nice manner one day late is a defect. Finally, you need the support of an effective problem resolution process. Let me take the first two of these together. This is an actual picture, an actual marketing picture, though I should clarify those aren't giant women. That's a diminutive aircraft. I thought otherwise, but I flew. This is an old picture from Iceland Air, and I did fly in them uh, recently, and everyone is of normal stature. So this is, however, an actual picture from an earlier era in air travel. And while it looks different from how we uh, sell air travel these days, it's not that different. Because what should matter in air travel? There's only one thing that should matter, right? Safety. Okay, safety. Now, the record of domestic commercial carriers in the US is extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. There hasn't been a fatality on a US commercial carrier since 2009. And yet, is that what's making the headlines? No. What we're talking about is you know, our friend, the fabulous Dave, Dave Carroll, and United broke his guitar. Now, I just want to clarify that they didn't break Dave. They didn't break Dave. They only broke his guitar. And yet, you don't hear. Um, us so excited every time our bags aren't lost. We hear about the surly flight attendants, the uh, ridiculous baggage fees, and so forth. Now, the perfect product is extremely
extremely, extremely important. But the little bit of caring that needs to be added is also very important. Timeliness is the third element. Uh, timeliness uh, is necessary, otherwise your otherwise perfect product is a defect. So companies that are dealing with timeliness issues that are embracing them rather than hiding from them, I think are doing well. So this uh, is a fast casual menu from Marriott. And instead of dividing items by entree and appetizer, they're dividing them by what will take five minutes, 10 minutes, or if you have all the time in the world, 20 minutes. And I think this is smart. This would obviously be catastrophically off-brand if you were, um, if you had a fine dining restaurant. But in a fast casual situation, I think this is very, very smart. Sometimes, though, you can't reset. Uh, you, I'm sorry, you cannot change the reality of how long it takes to deliver your product, in which case you need to reset client expectations. So Amazon is good about this, right? One of the revolutionary things that Amazon has done is the real-time inventory system online. And it's truly real-time. I think they stock all of maybe three copies of my book. So, if you bought all three copies, it won't show anymore that they are um, they are uh, in stock. So real-time inventory is a way of resetting client expectations. So you're not expecting the overnight or two-day delivery from Amazon on something that is not available. And this is the, the approach with an internal or external customer. A good approach is this. So someone calls you, they want something. They leave it, let's say, on a voicemail. They're over age 22, and they still use voicemail. So they leave you a voicemail saying, hi, I'd like to get a report on such and such. So you have two options. One, you could diligently start working on the report, and four days later, proudly pro provide it to the client. Well, they're not going to be very happy. However, if you called them back right away and said, thanks, this is a really important topic. It's going to take me five days to get this together for you. I'll have it absolutely for you first of the week, so they'll say, okay, fine, and then get it to them in five days or even better in four, then you are controlling um, the customer expectations. You're resetting the customer expectations. Now, one warning I want to give you are that some of us use timeliness metrics to try to improve our timeliness, and we end up sabotaging the goal of caring delivery. So here's one. Uh, do you feel? Do you aim to field 80% of your calls in 20 seconds or less? That's a good metric, but it's not the most important metric. Here's what might matter more. Number one, did the conversation resolve the issue? Number two. Did the customer like the resolution? It's better to have a good answer to items one or two here than it is to field your call in 20 seconds. They could wait 45 seconds and get a fabulous person on the line. However, you are going to be late. You are going to be perceived as less than caring. You are going to be less than perfect. That's why you need a problem resolution or customer service recovery pro, uh, process. And my mascot for this is the Italian mama. So to give credit where credit's due, my first book, Exceptional Service, Exceptional Profit, was co-authored by Leonardo Inhilari, who is Italian through and through. So we were trying to think, well, how are we going to get this uh, idea across to our somewhat courtroom method uh, obsessed American audience. So we thought, well, how about we tell them to act like an Italian mama? So here's what I mean. If her bambino or her grand bambino, I'm not sure how to say that in Italian, took a spill on the sidewalk, her attitude would be something like, oh, my poor baby, let me take you in, let me kiss your ouchie now. It's up to you, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that with your customers. 
but let me kiss your ouchie, let me give you a Band-Aid, and you can watch some TV and ha have a lollipop while your terrible wound heals. So if you spend much time with kids or customers, you'll know that they'll pretty quickly push back. They'll say, oh, Ma, it's not that bad. Can I go out and play? But if she took kind of our American courtroom method and she were more like, let me check out, let's sort out the facts, young man. Exactly what angle did your knee impact the sidewalk? Were you wearing a proper protective headgear before you set out? Then he or a customer is going to push back a bit and try to make it clear that they were hurt and that you're not hearing them. It's up to the customer to let you know when it's time to move on to the problem-solving stage. Now, I will caveat all this with the following. If you know your customers well, you can calibrate this. You can titrate this based on the particular customer. Some people are all business and some people are not. I'm just suggesting that you lean in, in the direction of being more empathetic and less problem solving at first. Remind you again, this is your chance to win high tech, high touch customer service. This is your chance to win it. This uh, non-commercial announcement has been brought to you by me. <laughs> I want to take us beyond satisfactory customer service for a moment. So, um, Satisfactory customer service got us to this level of they're dependable. We can pretty much rely on them. The problem is that there are three levels of service. And one level of service is, I would describe it as, or I would illustrate it as this. If Roy asked me for a glass of water in the dulcet tones of his announcer's voice, and I said, no, Roy, get that water yourself, that would be the first level of service. The problem for us is that our competitors aren't giving this level of non-service. Our competitors are pretty much at the following level of service. Roy asks me for a glass of water, and I give him a glass of water. Maybe I even smile. Maybe I even say, you're welcome, when he says, thank you. So it's hard to distinguish yourself with that level of service. Wouldn't it be nice if that's all you had to do? There is a third level of service, however, which would be personified by me seeing that Roy's kind of, he looks a, like he's just come in from a walk and I say, Roy, I saw you were looking thirsty. I brought you a glass of water. This is what I call anticipatory customer service. Another way to think about anticipatory customer service is to think of building a home for your customers. Now, this idea of building a home comes from the creation of the modern-day Ritz-Carlton brand. Now, we think of the Ritz-Carlton brand as not a surprise. They're happy to have us think of it as dating back to the early 1900s. But the reality is the amazing processes that we consider the Ritz-Carlton were pretty much put together in the 1980s. So they had this incredible brand, the Ritz-Carlton, and they wanted to know what it meant to their customers when they had just opened just a couple of hotels. So they got their best customers together, and the customers told them over and over, we want your hotels to be just like home. Well, I don't know about your house, but my house does not look like a Ritz-Carlton. There are dishes in the sink. The garbage hasn't been taken out in a day or two, and so forth. So they tried to, they probed more deeply. And what they decided was, these customers were saying, we want your hotel to be like an idealized home that we remember or we imagine from being a child with a caring parent or parents. Like the child, like the home of a caring child. I'm sorry, caring parents. The child is being cared by said parent. So if you think about this, this is a good uh, model for almost every business. It's not a good model for, let's say, if you were running a reform school maybe, um, but it is a very good model for most businesses because the parents welcome the child when the child comes home from school. It's clear that they've missed the kid. They are warmly said farewell to when they leave for an outing. 
The light bulbs are changed before the kid even notices they're flickering. The foods in the refrigerator are already stocked according to the child's personal preferences. I think this is a good model for almost any kind of business. Now, how are you going to get to this level of anticipatory service? You're going to start by hiring the right employees. If you already have the wrong employees, then we've got a whole other question here. But it starts ideally by starting to select for the right traits in employees. So what are the right traits? Well, I've tried to make it easy for you. Think of, this is going to sound goofy, but it really works. Think of a big, wet dog standing outside of Petco, a wet dog standing outside of Petco, because these spell wetco. The first one is warmth. That simply means your employees need to, on average, like other people. Second is empathy. This is a little more involved. This means that they can sense what someone else is thinking before someone says it. The third is teamwork, a willingness to work with their colleagues to solve customer issues. The fourth is conscientiousness. This is a detail-orientedness. And finally, they need optimism. Now, you don't need optimism in everyone in the organization. We all saw, and some of our savings were actually affected by, the fact that the accountants who worked for Enron were a really upbeat, optimistic crew. You don't need optimistic accountants. You don't need optimistic uh, chief safety officers. But you need optimism in your employees who work directly with customers. Otherwise, they will get so disheartened when a customer uh, deals with them unfairly, which will happen. The best employees in the world, so even if you do have the absolute best employees as far as personality traits, that doesn't go very far until you convince them to contribute their optional efforts, what I would call their elective efforts. So what does this mean? Well, this means getting something out of your employees that isn't really on their job description. And the way to do this, I would argue, is from orientation onward to uh, make it clear that every employee has a purpose as well as a function. Now, most orientations I've been to are pretty much along the lines of function. Be sure you know who your supervisor is. Be sure you know your job description. Uh, this is how you uh, fill out a form if you need to take some leave. Remember that the employee fridge is cleared out every Friday at 5. You better not have anything in there if that you care about or it won't be there Monday morning. But what it should be is it should be a very important person in the organization, if possible, the CEO. And as far as getting the CEO, let's take Danny Meyer from the uh, – from the Union Square Hospitality Group in New York. So Danny has always done the orientation. Now, he used to do it every time someone was hired. That got too hard for him. So what he does is he does it, I think, now every 45 days. They get together. Everyone has been hired in those days, and he does it. But someone who represents the organization and have them explain that although you have these job functions, you also have a purpose. And the purpose can be, well, some of the greatest ones are the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic may have the best one in the world. It's seven, I think, words. None of them are Latinate. Only one of them is longer than a syllable. It's the needs of the patient come first. The needs of the patient come first. Or the Ritz-Carlton, uh, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen which sounds very old-fashioned, and there's a reason for that. But what it means is service is an honorable profession, and we honor each other as well as honoring the people for whom we work. Or um, here's one that works in most environments, a pleasant, safe, memorable experience for our customers, right? A pleasant, safe, memorable experience for our customers. So what's the purpose of a security guard? Let's say not this uh, gentleman who uh, is quote unquote a security guard at a, I don't know what it is, a golf course or gated community. Think about a security guard at a shopping mall, right, at a shopping mall. So 99 plus percent of the time, 
he's not actually providing security, right? He's not chasing bad guys or deterring bad guys. He's got some time on his hand. So I think that his purpose should extend to include looking at people who have that very easy to recognize, I'm lost, where's the store I'm looking for, look on their face. And if he recognizes them, help them get where they're going to provide a pleasant, safe, memorable experience for his customers. A facilities manager. So this was at a McDonald's. I didn't name them by name when I saw this the first time. But when I came back two years later and saw it exactly the same, I'm going to name them. This was a McDonald's. So you can see that everything is in nice shape. It's clean. The toilet paper is appropriately rolled. But what is wrong? What's wrong is some contractor at least two years earlier has installed the toilet paper too high. And nobody has taken care of this. Nobody has said, I can't reach the toilet paper, and our guests won't be able to. E negatively memorable experience for your guests, and right for uh, including your handicapped guests. You would take care of this as part of your purpose at the job. Now, can I interrupt myself for a second and say, how are we doing for time? I've been. We're doing quite well. We're spot on there, Micah. I couldn't hear. How much How much time do I have left? Uh, you've got at least five minutes left. Five minutes? Yeah, you, got, you, you have plenty of time. Let's put it that way. Okay, but did you say five, like half of ten? Yeah, if we're going to have Q&A afterwards. So. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, thank you. So anticipatory service also means something which I call eliminating stupid stuff. If I knew you guys better, I might use a different S word for the second word. But it's stupid stuff. It's stuff where a customer has to contact you for a predictable reason against their will. So you only have your PO box listed on your website, and so they have to call you for the actual address to enter into their GPS. It's stupid things like that. Amazon is relentless about this. They may not be any good at all once you reach them on the phone, but they will do everything in their power to make sure that you don't ever need to call them. So every time a customer contacts Amazon, Amazon figures out the reason behind that call and then tries to eliminate the need for a customer to ever contact them again for that reason. This is the, the genesis of those, those auto confirmations that we all have grown so used to. That started with people calling Amazon back in the early Wild West days of the web and saying, hey, I just ordered online. I don't know if my order went through. I just And maybe it would be fun to talk to someone out there in cyberland. So they got tired of these calls really quickly, and so they invented the auto confirmation. And they take that approach to every contact that they feel can be eliminated. It also means shouldering burdens that traditionally belong to your customer. So do you know how to balance a checkbook? I do too. But I think more and more we're going to lose that art, that skill, because uh, banks are taking on this obligation with their uh, proactive messaging. Or, even protecting customers before they make a mistake. So I went to my local gas station and was astounded that they expected I was able to drive there successfully because once I'm at the uh, gas pump, I don't even need to be paying enough attention to uh, slip the magnetic stripe on the right side. It works either way. So if you were here in person, I would do a test with you. I would read you a long list of spices, for example starting in this case from tarragon and ending with marjoram. So what would happen on average, and in fact every single group I've ever done this test on, is you would remember the ones at the beginning quite well and the ones at the end quite well. The ones in the middle are the ones you tend to forget. And this is really important. This is called the serial position curve. And it's the way people remember. It's the way your customers remember. So this is a big box store in our lovely suburb in Philadelphia. This is not an urban environment. This is, if you ever saw the Philadelphia story, that took place 
maybe a mile from here. So it's a nice tree lawn suburban environment. And the manager thinks that the customer experience is starting at the door. So she's done something I think is kind of neat. She's put those uh, cart, uh, shopping carts outside to welcome you in and also to kind of imply that it's self-service. I think that's great. But what she hasn't done is walk just a couple feet outside her building, which is a problem because in our neighborhood, a lot of people walk. And when they walk, this is their first impression. So someone who works at this superstore should come out maybe once a year, whether they think it needs it or not, and clean out the trash bags, some of which are from their store, that are in effect welcoming them to the store. If you drove there, it's not much better. This picture, as you can see, looks like they have anger issues against customers with disabilities. Now, I doubt it. Something else is going on. The person who owns the strip mall didn't, didn't, um, didn't shovel this, but that's the impression it gives. And it's not once they're in the store. It is when a welcoming is happening before they realize it. You can give an impression of poor service at a very important time, which is the very beginning of the interaction. And you might not even realize an interaction has happened. Long hold times, uh, you, are you easy to reach? The parable of the unzipped zipper is that if you were my friend and my fly were uh, riding a little bit low, would you tweet about it? I sure hope not. I hope that you would whisper in my ear, hey, buddy, examine your zipper. So it's the same thing online. If someone knows that you care about them as a customer and that you're eager to hear their input, they're less likely to rant and rave online. Are your hours of operation not just listed right on your site, but on the sites that aggregate this information, like Google's properties? Are the interior pages of your website as welcoming as your home page? What's the customer's first impression of you online? Is it a bad review that's very prominent? Get it, fixing that is not easy, but you need to be aware of it, and you need to start working on it. The nice thing is that the dividends from a 3H, a human-centered viewpoint, are only going to continue to grow. Remember we have always talked about a customer's lifetime value, which is an important concept. But what's grown lately is a customer's lifetime network value. The Boston Consulting Group, in what I think is probably quite an understatement, is saying, the vast majority of millennials, that's younger customers, the vast majority of younger customers report taking action on behalf of brands and sharing their brand preferences in social groups. All customers are doing this now, and it's very powerful if you can get them to say the right things. Here's one last chance to win high-tech, high-touch customer service. I want to thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Lots of great information there. Uh, we thank do you. have a couple of questions for you. And let me just pull them up. And there we go. So uh, the qu one of the questions is, what metrics are most important for customer service? What metrics question. are most important for customer service? Uh, are there any other questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, second one is, and, and this is an equally interesting question, what technology is most important for customer service? So to, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you then, okay, so, so the problems with, with these questions, and the reason I'm hesitant to allocate my little bit of time to them is, Number one, I don't know anything about your business. I, I mean, for me to recommend technology would be, the only thing I could say about technology is you need to meet your customers where they are on technology. So they want a wide, wide and broad uh, variety of options to reach you. One option is not going to serve everyone. 
Um, I, it is my goal to go through one of these presentations without mentioning Zappos, but I am going to mention something about Zappos. So Zappos has excellent phone support, but it doesn't mean a lot of people call them. In fact, very, very few. They estimate fewer than 5% of their customers ever call them. And when they call, it's rarely to actually place an order. But they want to be there. You know what? I got that, that statistic wrong. I want to get that right. Fewer than 5% of their orders are taken over the phone. Okay. But they theorize that every customer will one time call them. And when that one call comes in, they want to be ready for it. They want to answer it quickly. And they want to use it as a connection to uh, as a connection that they're going to make with a customer. So have a wide variety of channels available. As far as a general recommendation on technology on your end, I would go the same direction. I would look at systems that take all sorts of customer input and put it into kind of a ticket ticketing system where the tweeting is not handled separately from the phone calls, is not handled separately from the emails. It all comes up in an orderly fashion. Even though you do want to work with each of them differently, it all comes up in, in, a, in an orderly fashion, which brings up another point which is your, cust your social customer responses need to be as good as any of your other responses. So we've all seen this. Someone who is great at technology and may be 12 years old or they may be 70 years old, but stereotypically they're, they're, they're younger, not because that means you're better at technology, but because it means you're more familiar with the technology that other young people are using is hired and put in charge of your social media customer support. Now, the issue with this is not that the person is young, because I think some of these millennials are some of the smartest, most empathetic people I've ever met. The issue is, are, is what they're doing integrated with your customer service philosophy? Or are they, to some extent, winging it? So is it technology driven? Or is it your philosophy driven? It needs to be philosophy driven. As far as metrics, these need to, these depend on the nature of what you're doing. However, they don't depend that much on the nature of what you're doing because one of the big dangers is to benchmark only your, in, your own industry. So um, I had a friend who tried to order, it's a true story, he tried to order a sofa a few months ago. Tried to order it. He made all the arrangements, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the call, the person said, that will be shipped to you in about 12 weeks. Now, maybe that's normal in this segment of the furniture industry. But it shouldn't be, right? Because my friend's expectations are driven by IKEA. They're driven by Starbucks, which is actually one of the places it takes longer to get a beverage. I mean, you can get a Coke out of the uh, vending machine quicker than you can get a Starbucks latte, but it's still a reasonable amount of time. So benchmarking other industries as well as your own is also a valuable thing to do, at least as far as level of service uh, timeliness and um, perception of caringness. Caringness is not a word. Sorry, scratch that. But we certainly get the message. That's, that's great information, good advice. And, and one of the things that I usually say when I talk about uh, metrics is that the most important benchmark is, is your own. How did you do this month as opposed to last month? Were there increases in what you wanted to increase? Were there decreases in what you wanted to decrease? How are you doing against your, your own self? So, so that's a, that's a great, great point about benchmarking uh, different industries, too. So thank you so much. Uh, lots of great comments coming through in the chat that uh, uh, people really enjoyed the presentation. So, and if you want to hang out in the chat with us for a little bit, that would be fabulous. Thanks again, Micah. OK, thank you so much. Ah, and uh, so I'd like to thank all the speakers today, uh, Shep Hyken, Mike Pace, and Micah Solomon. If you want to know more about them, there's a lot of information on the website at thinkhpi.com in the webinar section. Uh, there's some links there to other materials and books and reviews and whatever. So certainly uh, take advantage of that. I'd like to also once again thank the sponsors today, SolarWinds, 
BMC Software, and that's not their logo anymore. It was when we started today, but they, today they put uh, their new branding in place. So remember, orange is the new blue. And <laughs> and uh, they make all this, this technology possible uh, for us, and we appreciate their participation and sending their speakers over to, to deliver some good information to you. So uh, thanks very much. And don't go away, because in just a few minutes, you're welcome to hang out in the chat and discuss, and we're going to give away some prizes. Uh, and lest I forget, I also do want to mention some things that are coming up uh, at HDI. And just, I'm just going to remind you of what those prizes are here. Uh, I know that Mike mentioned it a couple of times, but his book is one of our prizes today, as is a conference registration for HDI 2015 at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. If you've ever been to an HDI conference, you know how much fun they are and how great it is to see uh, your peers and, and people that you've met over the years that you've been doing some for. So uh, don't miss your opportunity to get that. Coming up uh, in the webcast theater uh, is uh, Lynch Warsaw, who's going to do a presentation on security. When the it hits the fan, who are you going to call? And uh, it is Cyber Security <laughs> Month, so don't miss that presentation by Wynn. He's really a top-notch security expert. And then after that, November 16th, we'll be talking about maintaining and improving service delivery. So we're an IT service management focus in November with Rick Mims, who's just terrific. He's a former member of the HDI faculty, and Rick is a very, very interesting speaker, so don't miss that. And uh, coming right up uh, is from October 19th to 22nd, we'll be seeing some of you in Washington at the Gaylord National for Fusion 14, which is our joint conference with ITSMF. So uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for coming out today, and we'll announce the prizes in just a few minutes, so don't go away. Thank you. <laughs>